It had always been a statement of intent for General Heinz Guderian that a fully balanced and truly effective armoured division must have its own organic, fully tracked, self-propelled artillery, able to maintain the same rate of advance as the panzers and be immediately to hand to give fire support when needed. That Guderian's notion could have been given reality in the period of German rearmament during the 1930s was a pipe dream. While subtle and sophisticated propaganda fed to audiences at home and abroad fostered the image of an immensely powerful Third Reich, the reality was that the rearmament program was very broad but had little depth. Adolf Hitler wanted war, but he had no intention of submitting Germany to a repeat of the debilitating conflict that had led her to defeat in the Great War. Even the rearmament program as it stood was financed at a much lower level than was propagandized by Hitler, and few were aware of the real economic strains it was causing the German economy even before the war began. When war came, Hitler wanted it to be short and sharp. The conflict that broke out on the 1st of September 1939 saw Germany ill-prepared for anything but a very short war. Certainly the Panzer Arm was nowhere near ready to embark on a major conflict. The medium tanks on which the basis of the war-making potential of the new Panzer Arm were based were only just coming off the production line. Output of Panzers was low and was to remain so for some years after war began. At this stage, there was no way that the German panzer divisions could expect to be equipped with their own tracked artillery when the tanks they were meant to support had yet to be produced in adequate numbers. This unpreparedness was mirrored in the lorry supply. By the onset of Barbarossa, transport detachments were driving vehicles trawled from the inventory of every country that Germany had conquered. But nowhere was the facade of modernity better seen for what it was than in the artillery. While a small number of artillery pieces employed in direct support of the fast-moving panzer divisions were towed by half-track, by far and away the majority of the army's artillery was pulled by horses. Three million horses went into Russia with the German army. Fine sinew and muscle underpinned the great advances into the Soviet hinterland in the opening phase of Barbarossa. The scene of miles of horse-drawn columns moving eastwards could have been taken from a snap of German forces doing the same when marching deep into Russia in 1918. Although the German economy was to undertake remarkable expansion in the years ahead, provide self-propelled weapons in large numbers, Guderian never got them in the quantity he deemed necessary. The very first Panzer Jager, a class of lightly armoured, self-propelled anti-tank guns mounted on a tank chassis, employed the Panzer 1B. First appearing in 1940, it was built around the former Czech 47mm anti-tank gun, which had both a higher muzzle velocity and a heavier weight of shot than the Germans' own Pack 36. 86 rounds of ammunition was carried. Armour protection for the crew of three was minimal. The open-topped and open-back superstructure mounted just 14.5 mm on the gun shield. 202 were converted by Daimler Benz and Skoda, with production ending in February 1941. Most were employed after 1941 in Russia. A small number of Panzer Jager I served in North Africa. Battalion 605, comprising three companies, was shipped to Libya in early 1941. This unit participated in all the major battles in the Western Desert through to El Alamein. In late 1940, the same gun was ordered to be mounted on captured French Renault R35 chassis as a replacement for the Panzer I. It saw service mainly in the Normandy campaign. Surviving Panzer Jager 1Bs withdrawn from service in 1943 ended their days in training establishments. Significantly, it was another foreign weapon that was mounted on the next Panzer Jagers. It was to prove most fortuitous for the German army that they captured many excellent Soviet 76mm anti-tank guns in 1941. The encounter with new Soviet tanks early in the Russian campaign was a shock to the German army. Intelligence had given no intimation of the existence of the KV-1 or KV-2. Only the proficiency of their military technique compensated the Germans for the technical superiority of these new machines. It was, however, T-34 medium tank that caused the greatest alarm, for it represented a quantum leap in tank design. 
For German infantry forced to combat these formidable machines, the impotence of the standard 37mm Pac-36 anti-tank gun, already demonstrated in the French campaign, now received more telling confirmation in Russia. Even at point-blank range, the armor-piercing shot from the weapon just bounced off the thick armor of these Soviet monsters. Nor did the 50mm Pac-38, introduced in small numbers just prior to Barbarossa, fare much better. Only at close range could this weapon penetrate the armor of these Soviet tanks. The Germans turned to the 76mm M1936 and 1939 field guns captured in such vast numbers since June 1941. Rechambered to accept the ammunition of the Pac-40 75mm anti-tank gun, which was rushed into service before the end of 1941, the rechristened Pac-36-39 saw service with the German army until the end of the war. The prototype Panzer Jager 38T emerged as early as December 1941. So great was the need to field a self-propelled gun that could take on the powerful Soviet types. The Pac-36-39 was a formidable anti-tank weapon. Although production of the vulnerable Panzer 38T battle tank ended in 1942, its chassis was manufactured as a self-propelled mount for anti-tank and artillery weapons until 1945. The availability of the Panzer II D and E variants in late 1941 also led to their being earmarked for conversion to mount the 76mm anti-tank gun. Surprisingly, the first Panzer Jager 38Ts, known as the Marda III, did not receive their baptism of fire in Russia, but with the Africa Corps. But whether operating in the desert or on the steppes of Russia, the new vehicle was clearly a stopgap design, no matter how desperately needed. While the gun was able to penetrate up to 55 mm of armour out to 2,000 metres, this Marda was handicapped by its high silhouette. While in Russia, crews could attempt to hide their machine and lie in wait for the enemy before firing, in a desert devoid of cover, this was more difficult. Protection was very weak, the gun shield offering a maximum of just 15 mm of armour, making the crew quite vulnerable to direct enemy fire as well as shrapnel from shells exploding near to the vehicle. Even so, 363 were produced by BMM of Prague. The cumbersome appearance of the conversion of the Panzer IId into Marder II indicates the urgency with which the 201 produced between April and June 1942 were needed at the front. The Panzer Jager IId was first seen on newsreel when the tank hunting battalion of the rested and rebuilt 1st Waffen-SS Division, Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, paraded through Paris along the Champs-Élysées, with other detachments in the formation in July 1942. All wear the standard overall colour of very dark grey. Taking the salute was Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, Commander-in-Chief of Army Group West. Most of the 150 machines completed by May 1942 went to the Eastern Front for service with the Panzer and Panzer Grenadier divisions committed to the German offensive in southern Russia. While the 76mm gun gave a good account of itself, the Marder II also suffered from the same problem as the Marder III of a high silhouette. A firepower demonstration of the Panzer Jager IId was given to Reichsmarshal Hermann Goering, when he visited the training unit of the tank hunting battalion of the division named after him in April 1943. Just two months later, 10,000 troops of the division were to surrender when the Axis bridgehead in Tunisia fell to the Allies. Development of the 75mm Pac-40 had been slow, even though contracts for the new anti-tank gun had been issued in 1939. The appearance of new Soviet armour had ended the complacency, an accelerated programme led to Rheinmetall Borzig producing the first Pac 40s for service by the end of 1941. The Pac 40 was an excellent weapon. Its low profile allowed its gun crew to maximise advantage of the penetrative power of its armour piercing shot and range. It could cut through 100 millimetres of armour sloped at 30 degrees at a range of 500 metres. While the normal rate of fire was 12 rounds per minute, an experienced crew could raise that total. The undoubted effectiveness of the Pac-40 saw it employed as the standard anti-tank gun and as a light artillery piece with the German army until the end of the war. It was also employed on numerous chassis as a self-propelled anti-tank gun. 
In June 1942, Farmo, Mann and Daimler Benz had been instructed to divert 75% of their Panzer II production so that the chassis could be employed as the basis of a new Panzer Jager mounting the 75mm anti-tank gun. The resultant vehicle, designated the Marder II, was manufactured until June 1943, when the decision was taken to turn over production of all Panzer II chassis to building the Vespa self-propelled light howitzer. By then, 651 Marder IIs had been produced, employing new build and converted early model Panzer IIs returned to Germany. The Marder II had the by now standard Panzerjager open-topped configuration, with light armour mounted to the front and sides of the gun compartment. While issued to self-propelled Panzerjager battalions, many Marder IIs were also used by paratroop units, who, after the high losses in the invasion of Crete, Hitler ordered employed as ground troops. Although serving on all fronts to war's end, the bulk were employed in Russia, where they took a heavy toll of Soviet armour. The reach of the Pak-40 enabled the crew to take out most Russian tanks. With the onset of winter, whitewash was applied to aid concealment of the vehicle as it moved across the wide open steps. Serving alongside Marder IIs of the SS Panzer Corps in February and March 1943 are mid-production Marder IIs on the Panzer 38T chassis mounting the 75mm Pac-40, which first left the production line at BMM of Prague in October 1942. Replacing the original Soviet gun Marder III, the new model employed a redesigned lower fighting compartment to house the German Pac-40 anti-tank gun of which 417 were manufactured. The Marder III's of the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler are fighting in the suburbs of the city of Kharkov, the scene of a major battle between the troops of the SS Panzer Corps and those of the Soviet Voronezh Front in early March 1943. Marder III saw heavy action throughout 1943, that illustrated here serving with the Panzer Jager Battalion of the 3rd SS Panzer Grenadier Division Totenkopf at the Battle of Kursk in July. Mid-production Marder III's were also extensively employed in the Panzer Jager battalions of Army and Luftwaffe field divisions, serving as far afield as Russia through to Italy. Operation Axis, the long-prepared German contingency plan for the occupation of Italy, took place in September 1943. Among the forces streaming across the mountains into northern Italy was this contingent of late-production Marder III's. This new model is the consequence of a major reworking of the Panzer 38T chassis, which saw the engine recited to the centre of the vehicle and the fighting compartment for the Pac-40 moved to the rear. Nearly 1,000 were manufactured by BMM. Self-propelled guns were employed in far greater numbers than tanks by the Germans in the Italian theatre, the mountainous terrain being more suitable to their tactical employment. This is well demonstrated by this film of a late Marder III operating in the vicinity of Monte Cassino in the first half of 1944. Employing the ruins of a bombed out village, the Marder crawls out of cover on word of approaching targets. Mindful of the ability of pilots to spot tank tracks from the air, these are brushed away by one of the crew. The Marder moves to a firing position on the edge of the village, giving it a superb vantage point over the valley below. With the enemy targeted, the gunner loads the armour-piercing Panzer Grenade 40 ammunition. After a couple of shots, the Marder scuttles back to its hide before its position can be bracketed by artillery or targeted by enemy aircraft. Late model Marder III saw extensive employment in Normandy from the 6th of June onwards. In common with all German military vehicles in the theatre, extensive camouflage was vital if they were to survive the attentions of Allied fighter bombers. The Germans employed large numbers of the chassis of captured French tanks as the basis of self-propelled guns. While a number of FCM and Hotchkiss chassis were employed to mount the Pac-40, the greatest number were manufactured using the Lorraine tracked carrier. A sizeable quantity of these reliable machines had fallen into German hands in 1940, and in 1942, with the desperate need to motorise as many anti-tank guns as possible, the decision was taken to convert 170 Lorraine carriers to mount the Pac-40. While a number found their way to Russia and Italy, the bulk were retained for service with the occupation forces in France. 
Film of the Lorraine Schlepper is rare, and this comes from Normandy in 1944. Few, if any, of these machines were to survive the destruction of the German forces in the campaign. Most extensively converted of all the French types was the Hotchkiss H39, which was effectively gutted and rebuilt to mount the Pack 40, just 24 being so modified, all served in France. The final chassis to be adopted to mount the Pack 40 was very much a desperate expedient that reflected Germany's dire military predicament in late 1944. In a bid to place as many anti-tank guns as possible on self-propelled mounts, Hitler ordered that the 251D half-track be modified to mount the Pack 40. The complete weapon, less its wheels, was fitted with little modification into the half-track. Serviced by a crew of four, it carried 22 rounds of 75mm ammunition. However, the weapon overstressed the chassis and the 25122 was decidedly overweight. One of the first Hetzers to come off the production lines was presented to Hitler on the occasion of his birthday on the 20th of April 1944. This new variation on the Panzer 38T chassis marked a radical shift away from the conventional tank hunter with its highly vulnerable open-topped crew and gun compartment. The Hetzer, although designed for service in tank hunting battalions, was modelled on the purpose-designed and sophisticated tank destroyers with their fully enclosed and armoured bodies. It was for this reason that the Hetzer was classified not as a Panzerjager, but as a Jagdpanzer. Production of the Hetzer began at the Skoda Works and at BMM in May 1944, with the phase-out of the Marda III. Primary armament remained the 75mm gun. While the enclosed armoured body offered the crew far better personal protection than the earlier tank hunters, it also led to cramped conditions, making movement within the machine quite difficult. This also inhibited movement of the gun, which had a constricted field of fire in consequence. In spite of these limitations, the Hetzer became one of the most effective and frequently encountered vehicles serving in the German army in the last year of the war. Successful employment of the assault gun in its adoptive role of tank destroyer led to the development of one type to fulfil both roles, built round an armoured body mounted on the chassis of the Panzer IV. The Jagdpanzer IV entered production with Vomag in January 1944 and mounted a 75mm L48 cannon. These served with the 116th Panzer Division in Normandy. In August 1944, the Jagdpanzer IV was upgunned to carry the 75mm L70 cannon as mounted on the Panther tank. As the weight of the gun made the chassis nose heavy, the rubber tyres on the first two bogies were replaced with steel wheels. Parallel to the Panzer IV 70 built by Vomag was a variation produced by neighbour Lungenwerke of Austria. The modified Jagdpanzer IV body was grafted directly onto a standard Panzer IV hull. This led to the Panzer IV 70A, distinguishable from the Vomag model by its vertical sides. The largest, heaviest and most powerful anti-tank gun to see regular service with the German army was the 88mm Pack 43. The weapon realised its maximum muzzle velocity of 1,130 metres per second when using tungsten shot and could penetrate a T-34 up to 3,500 metres. Employing an identical chassis derived from the Panzer III and IV and sharing the same superstructure as the Hummel self-propelled gun, the 88mm Pack 43 armed Nashorn first saw employment during Operation Citadel in July 1943. While similar in appearance to earlier improvised Panzer Jager, the Nashorn was very much a purpose-designed vehicle built around the Pack 43. Unlike its smaller brethren, it was not distributed to Panzer Jager battalions, but retained in special detachments at core level and farmed out according to need. Most of the 494 built served in Russia, but were encountered in Italy serving through to war's end. The standard field gun employed by the German army at divisional level from the time of its introduction in 1935 to the end of the war was the 105mm FH-18. This piece saw service on every front, from the frozen wastes of northern Finland to the boiling desert of North Africa. A versatile and widely employed weapon, the FH-18 utilised a split trail carriage and, in earlier models, large pressed steel centre rubber-tired wheels. 
Later variants, these were replaced with spoke types. Firing a 14.8 kilogram shell, it could range out to a maximum distance of approximately 10,500 meters. Experience in the east, where the gun's weight caused it to sink in the mud, led to the employment of a lighter carriage derived from the 75mm Pac-40 anti-tank gun, while the 2514 and the 3 ton 11 half-tracks were employed to tow the 105mm gun in North Africa and Russia, the bulk of those employed in Europe and the east relied on horse-drawn artillery teams. In 1939, a muzzle brake was added to increase the range of the gun. Designed in 1942 to confer greater mobility for the 105mm guns attached to mobile formations, the Vespa self-propelled gun employed a much modified Panzer II chassis. Although designed by Alket, production was undertaken by Farmo. In February 1943, the decision was taken to divert the production of all Panzer II chassis to the manufacture of the Vespa. The new self-propelled gun first saw employment during Operation Citadel, the Kursk Offensive in July 1943. Seen in action are those belonging to the SP detachment of the 3rd SS Panzer Grenadier Division Totenkopf. From mid-1943 onwards, the Vespa began to appear in growing numbers in the self-propelled artillery units of the Panzer and Panzer Grenadier Divisions. Equipment of formations in the east received priority as the need of mobile artillery to move and support the rapidly moving panzer formations became paramount as they were stretched ever more thinly being moved from one place to another to combat ever increasing Soviet breakthrough. The ability of panzer formations to deploy their own mobile artillery allowed them to maximize their limited assets when launching counterattacks against the seemingly ever growing Red Army. Deployed close to the front line, the Vespers would launch a concentrated barrage prior to the attack and then accompany the armour as it moved forward. Ad hoc battle groups comprising many diverse weapons, including Vespers, were rapidly put together by the Germans to deal with enemy breakthroughs, such as seen here in the late summer of 1944. A local counterattack is launched by German forces supported by Stukas in western Bielorussia. Overseeing the operation is Luftwaffe General Robert Ritter von Green. After the preliminary air bombardment, German infantry move forward to deal with the enemy. The weaponry employed in the Kampfergruppe includes Panther tanks, Marder III tank destroyers, armoured personnel carriers, mobile flak artillery, towed 88mm flak guns and self-propelled artillery support provided by a small detachment of Vespers. The appearance of the Soviet Air Force flying Ilushin II Sturmovics leads to a barrage of anti-aircraft fire from the 88mm guns. The Soviet aircraft try and target the panzers moving across the plane. A number are hit and shot down as 37mm guns join in the anti-aircraft barrage. The Vespa detachment now brings its guns to bear on identified enemy positions prior to a further infantry assault. The mobile 20mm flak veerling now joins in fire as the aerial battle with the attacking Soviet Ilushin IIs continues unabated. German ground troops move forward under attack from the Soviet aircraft as the flak guns continue to pour fire into the air to provide a protective barrage to the ground forces. Sturmovik, hit by German flak, plunges to the ground. Although bombs from the Soviet aircraft still fall, German infantry continues to move forward. While casualties are moved from the field, the battle with the attacking Soviet ground attack aircraft continues unabated. Bombing and artillery fire combine to reduce the near horizon to a wall of explosions. In the final sequence, the 88mm flak score another victim as a Soviet fighter streams smoke before diving to the ground. While the Vespa was generally welcomed by its operators, it was not without its faults. 
The Panzer II chassis made for a small vehicle and the fighting compartment mounted at the rear of the machine was quite constricted for the four-man crew to service the gun. In common with other open-top self-propelled weapons, it offered little protection and it had a high silhouette. Nonetheless, the 676 produced, in addition to 159 munitions carriers that were employed to transport the 105mm ammunition, served well through to the end of the war. They were encountered not just in the East, but also in Western Europe by the Allies from June 1944 onwards. Reference has already been made to the extensive use the Germans made of captured French tanks for self-propelled guns. One of the most filmed employed an extensively modified Hotchkiss light tank chassis to mount the 105mm howitzer. 48 of these self-propelled guns were produced for units serving in France in 1942. These saw extensive action with the 8th Panzer Artillery Battalion in the Normandy campaign. They served alongside Lorraine tracked carriers, also modified to carry the 105mm FH-18. Just 24 of these were produced. As with all German vehicles serving in Normandy, a prerequisite for survival was the need to operate from cover. Although the distinctive camouflage scheme of overall sand with large block sections of olive green was effective, it was necessary to augment this by employing the trees and hedges of the Normandy countryside to hide from the constant presence of highly effective Allied fighter bombers. Once in place, the crew prepared the ammunition and began to fire. These SPs carried about 32 rounds, a similar amount to that of the Vespa. They are seen operating with a detachment of Hummel heavy SP guns from an SS Panzer division. Entering service in 1933, the SIG 33 equipped the heavy gun platoons of infantry regiments and remained in service until 1945. Limited to a maximum range of just 4,700 metres, its task was to lay down heavy fire and suppress enemy opposition as German infantry went into the attack. Its shell was relatively heavy at 38 kilograms and the gun had a rate of fire of between two and three rounds per minute. It was this that saw it employed on the first self-propelled artillery vehicle developed for the German army. The decision to mount the SIG 33 on a self-propelled chassis led to the employment of the Panzer 1B. The mount was designed by Orkett of Berlin, who converted 38 Panzer 1 chassis in February 1940. And these were in service for the French campaign. The resultant vehicle weighed some three tons more than the standard Panzer 1B. The 150mm gun was mounted in a large box-shaped compartment atop the hull and looked decidedly cumbersome. It was taken into battle by six heavy infantry gun companies in May 1940, each being attached to a panzer division. The only film of this vehicle in action shows it being used to effect, to blast defences as German infantry moved through a French town. In general, the vehicle proved successful in action and was later employed in the Balkans and Russia, finally disappearing from the battlefield in late 1943, when the survivors were serving with the 5th Panzer Division in the east. No others were built, for it was recognised that the gun overtaxed the light chassis and the very high silhouette was undesirable. An attempt to mount the SIG 33 on a Panzer II chassis in 1941 proved abortive, just 12 being built. Nevertheless, the SIG 33 on the Panzer 1B provided the German army with much formative experience in the operation of self-propelled artillery. The most numerous self-propelled types to mount the SIG 33 were those that employed the Panzer 38T chassis. Both models produced were known as the Bison. The first emerged in February 1943 and used the tank chassis with the gun mounted forward inside a box-like superstructure. As these weapons were required for service in the forthcoming summer campaign, the first 90 of the type seen here were converted using Panzer 38T Model H's returned from the front and then issued to heavy infantry gun companies of Panzer Grenadier divisions. The Bison saw widespread service in 1943 and was employed in Tunisia, France and Russia. The example seen here belonging to the Waffen SS was employed in the Battle of Kursk in July. Small numbers were also encountered in Normandy in 1944. 
Seen in Milan in August 1943, where it was sent for security duties after its mauling at Kursk, is this rarely filmed 38T Bison, belonging to the 1st SS Panzergrenadier Division, Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. It passes a late Marder III, belonging to the Panzer Jager Battalion of the division. 282 of the final model of the Bison saw the SIG 33 mounted on the identical 38T chassis as used for the late model Marder III Tank Hunter. The SIG 33 was also employed in 1941 to produce a powerful, fully armoured infantry assault gun on the Panzer III E and F8 chassis. Series production was not undertaken, just 24 being produced. And these served at Stalingrad in 1942 with the survivors operating in the Kuban bridgehead in southern Russia. Making its debut with the 216th Sturmpanzer Abteilung at the Battle of Kursk in July 1943 were 60 Sturmpanzer IV Brumbars. This machine had been designed as a heavy armoured assault vehicle and had found particular favour with Hitler, who'd ordered its production in October 1942. The SIG 33 was ball mounted in a very heavy armoured box with 100 millimetres of armour to the front and 50 millimetres on the side. The first version lacked a forward firing machine gun and the driver's vision slit was mounted low down on the front superstructure face. The mid production Brumbar could be distinguished by the periscope mounted on the driver's housing. A fleeting glimpse of a late model Brumbar can be caught behind the vehicle's crew as they line up to be presented with decorations for their bravery whilst engaged in heavy fighting with British forces on the border with Holland. The armoured superstructure of the Brumbar offered comparatively greater protection and space for its five-man crew than did the hull and turret of a standard Panzer IV. In addition, the late model Brumbar had been substantially reworked to incorporate significant improvements to the design. The omission of a machine gun for close-in defence was rectified by fitting a ball mount high on the left side of the front superstructure plate. Armoured configuration on the front plate was also improved. The calibre of the standard heavy artillery piece of the German army throughout the war was 150 millimetres. These weapons were employed in a number of different versions. While the bulk of this heavy artillery was horse-drawn, those 150mm FH-18s attached to panzer divisions were towed. Each panzer division had three battalions of artillery, one heavy, each with three batteries of four guns towed by an eight-ton half-track. While the speed with which half-tracks could bring the heavy weapons up to the front line was impressive, compared to the ponderous horse artillery, the setting up of the piece to fire on its designated target might take up to half an hour. The performance of the weapon itself, however, was satisfactory, the FH-18 being able to fire a shell of 43.5 kilograms out to 13,000 metres. What the mobile formations desired was a fully tracked vehicle that could mount a 150mm gun and be available for employment on demand. They had to wait until 1943. The prototype of the Hummel self-propelled gun mounted a 150mm howitzer with a large muzzle brake on a Panzer III IV chassis. It appeared in 1942 when the decision was taken to commit it to production. Hummels first saw action during Operation Citadel in July 43. these being operated by the Heavy Artillery Battalion of the SS Panzer Grenadier Division Totenkopf. Early Hummels can be recognised by the driver's compartment which stood proud of the sloping front plate. In the later model this compartment was extended across the whole front of the vehicle. When not in use the 150mm howitzer was locked in place by the large bracket mounted on the glasses plate. The Hummels shared the open top superstructure made of thin armour plating found on all German self-propelled guns at this time. This was less problematic for the crew in as much as they opened fire some distance away from the main fighting and were not so vulnerable as the crews of Panzerjager. Initial allotment of Hummels was limited, just six being allocated to receiving Panzer divisions together with a number of the ammunition carrying variants to help resupply the self-propelled guns in the field. These were necessary vehicles as the Hummel only carried 18 rounds of 150 mil ammunition on board. These were often rapidly expended once a barrage began. 
The availability of the Hummel gave the Panzer divisions the heavy punch to hit the Soviet forces whenever they were required to launch a counter-attack to contest a new breakthrough. Although the Hummel was always regarded as interim solution, pending development of a purpose-designed SP gun, these were never enough to satisfy demand. Often Hummels were seen to be firing alongside the smaller Vespa self-propelled guns as seen here in Hungary in early 1945 while fighting around Budapest. It was perhaps symptomatic of the waning strength of German military power that when Dr. Goebbels chose to make a last visit to the Oda front in March 1945, he was taken to watch the firing of a solitary Hummel. This vehicle had proved itself to be an extremely effective weapon and by the time production ended in 1944, 666 gun vehicles and 150 resupply vehicles had been constructed by Alket and Deutsche Eisenwerk. The German army entered the Second World War in possession of a range of unique and highly effective light anti-aircraft guns that were to be employed throughout the conflict with great success. The light 20mm Flak 30 emerged in the 1930s and was already in widespread service when this film about the Luftwaffe was put out by the Air Ministry. Drawn by Krupp boxers, the light flat guns are driven to their fire positions. The gun is then unhitched and slid off its carrying chassis onto its base and made ready for firing. The soldier wearing the rangefinder pulls out the distances to Dornier DO-23's lumber overhead. The flat gun is speedily turned on its axis to follow the planes round by the crew as the gunner lets fly at the targets. Six years later, the same procedure is followed as the flak fires on Allied aircraft over the Straits of Messina. As a crewman stands watch on a flak veiling in Russia, another opens fire on Allied warplanes over southern Italy. It is joined by a 37mm flak and single 20mm flak, the three weapons employed on the most German self-propelled flak vehicles until 1945 and used in action from the Arctic Ocean to the Aegean the Bay of Biscay to the Black Sea. The DMAG one-ton half-track was the first vehicle to be employed for the purpose of mounting a flat gun. Initially the type was armed with a 20mm Flak 30 cannon, but this was later superseded by the Flak 38. Although ostensibly designed for the purpose of protecting military formations from air attack, this variant was employed as much in a ground support role. The 20mm cannon was ideally suited for shooting up ground targets, being supplied with armour piercing as well as high explosive ammunition. In the opening phases of the Russian campaign, it was discovered that the flak could be used to penetrate the thin armour of the very numerous and obsolescent Soviet light tanks. Although ammunition was carried in six small bins attached to the drop sides of the flatbed on which the gun was mounted, most D-Mags carried a further and larger supply in a two-wheeled trailer. A total number of seven crewmen were required to drive the half-track and operate the flat gun. The principal disadvantage of this type was that the crew were totally exposed to enemy fire, steps to give the vehicle a modicum of armour protection not being taken until late in the production run an armoured cab being provided for the driver and a shield for the flat gun. Other than this modification, the DMAG remained otherwise unchanged, being produced by a variety of industrial concerns until production was halted in 1944, by which time 610 had been produced. It was to serve in all theatres and saw action until the end of the war. The Flak Panzer 38T was a makeshift machine put into production to bolster numbers of mobile flak pending availability of more sophisticated flak panzers. With Luftwaffe air superiority long since vanished from the skies above the battlefields in east and west, the army needed every flak vehicle it could muster. The German army had a propensity for arming every chassis that could mount a worthwhile weapon. Standard lorries like the Opel Blitz and Horch heavy passenger car were modified to carry the 20mm flak, most being employed in the ground support role.
Such was the versatility of the Krauss Maffe built 8 ton half track that 319 were employed to mount the 20 mm flak veerling with production continuing until 1944. To accommodate the weapon, all the seating and ammunition stowage lockers of the artillery prime mover were removed and replaced with a flatbed with dropped sides. The flak veerling was mounted on the flatbed. Ten crew were needed to both drive and service the weapon and the ammunition was normally carried in a trailer. The need for some degree of protection for the driver was recognised in 1943 when an armoured cab was fitted. An example of this later type is seen in Budapest in early 44. One of the more graphic sequences of film showing the flak veerling and eight-ton half-track in action was taken during the Operation Market Garden, the abortive Allied attempt to seize and hold the bridges over the River Rhine at Arnhem in September 1944. Cameraman was on hand to record an SS flak veerling being employed to shoot up the descending British paratroopers and the aircraft bringing them from England. Later supply flights by Sterling Transports paid dearly as the flak was able to take advantage of their need to fly low over the drop zones. Many were lost. Armoured lorries also mounted the flak veerling. This example is seen in Italy in 1944. While just 3,000 five-ton half-tracks were built by Bussing Nag, some 339 were utilised to mount the 37mm flak 36. As with all the half-tracks modified as flat carriages, the troop compartment was replaced by a flatbed with dropped sides. Ammunition was carried in a trailer. The weapon was used in the anti-aircraft and ground support roles, and most were employed in the east. These five-ton half-tracks are serving with the flak battalions of the 2nd SS Panzer Grenadier Division on the advance of the SS Panzer Corps during the Kursk Offensive in July 1943. The 8-ton 7 half-track was adapted to carry the 37mm Flak 36 in 1943 when production of the 5-ton 37mm Flak carriage was ended. The addition of the gun raised the chassis weight to 11.5 tons. Ammunition for the Flak gun was carried in a Sonder Anhanger 57, a trailer specially designed to carry 37mm ammunition. The Flak 36 was a powerful weapon and was often used in a direct fire roll. Most of the half-tracks seen in this sequence belong to the Waffen-SS and in particular the Flak Abteilung of the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. Seen here in Rome, it is a late machine with an armoured cab. Moving along a Normandy road is a camouflaged Opel Multier mounting a 37mm Flak. From the newsreel of May 1943 comes film of a major Luftwaffe ground exercise in Russia involving a full-strength Flak unit. Of interest is the diversity of equipment being employed. Apart from the standard DMAG one-ton half-tracks mounting the 20mm flak, there are also a large number of modified four-wheel drive Mercedes-Benz 4.5-ton lorries. The commander of this 88mm gun detachment seemingly has no compunction about employing his weapon in a ground support or anti-tank role. Colonel Hans von Luke of 21st Panzer Division was to recall how in Normandy he had to threaten to shoot an officer of the Luftwaffe 16th Field Division who refused to employ his 88s in the anti-tank role during Operation Goodwood. The period when this film was taken is significant. The Eastern Front was experiencing its longest lull of the war as the Soviets deliberately held back from offensive operations in order to prepare to receive the inevitable German summer offensive directed at the Kursk salient. The period prior to July the 5th, when Operation Citadel was finally launched, marked one of the most rigorous periods of training and exercises undertaken by the German armies in the east. The supposition is that this unit is waiting to take part in the operation. Although Luftwaffe command of the air was no longer assured in Russia, the Red Air Force had yet to achieve the dominance that it would in the future. Luftwaffe flak units would under such circumstances be more likely to find themselves firing on tanks instead of aircraft. That, however, would very soon change. Soviet air attacks on German ground formations and supply lines never achieved the scale or sophistication realised by the Allies in Western Europe. However, the loss of command of the air in the east did render German forces far more vulnerable and 
throughout that period, Soviet air assaults began to increase in scale. As German ground defence was increasingly based upon mobile forces, the demand grew for far more flak vehicles able to deal with the problem. In the West, Allied air dominance was overwhelming. D-Day onwards saw a wave of Allied air operations in which fighter bombers roamed across France and the Low Countries, strafing any German ground traffic that could be found. In this typical example, United States Army Air Force P-38 Lightnings and P-47 Thunderbolts fly in low to hit German positions. In the total absence of the Luftwaffe, all the German Army could rely upon was flak to protect themselves. But more was always needed, and the demand was that it should be mobile, based upon full-track chassis. It was also becoming very clear that many Allied aircraft were now so well protected as to no longer succumb to hits from 20mm flak. Heavier weapons were demanded, with 37mm being the operative calibre to enable Allied aircraft to be brought down in greater numbers. Out of these demands emerged the new generation of German flak panzers. Some were stopgap, placed into service pending production of more sophisticated and powerful types. Examples such as the Kugelblitz and Panther Kolian employed heavier calibre and much faster firing weapons none of these reached service before Germany's defeat in May 1945. The Verbal Wind emerged towards the end of 1943 as a fully tracked anti-aircraft tank employing the chassis and body of a Panzer IV. A purpose-built 16mm armoured turret had been designed within which the crew of the 20mm flak veerling could operate the gun with a degree of protection. Verbal Wind are operating on the German border in the vicinity of Metz in late 1944. They're firing on American bombers. A hail of 20mm cannon shells sent up by the Verbal Winds has claimed an American B-26 Marauder bomber. Just 86 Verbal Winds were produced with production ending in November 1944. By then the decision had been made that the 20mm calibre was no longer adequate to deal with Allied aircraft and that continuance of production of a flak panzer with such a weapon was a waste of resources. Replacement for the verbal wind was the Ostwind, which employed a single 37mm flak 43 in a similar turret and mounted on a converted panzer IV. The Flak 43 was also employed in another Panzer IV conversion with a four-sided superstructure that could be dropped for firing. It was named the Furniture Van for obvious reasons. 240 were produced until March 1945. Both Ostwind and Mobilwagen were to have been replaced by the Kugelblitz, mounting two rapid-fire 30mm cannon in a new turret. But the war ended before it could be produced in any number. Seeing service in the closing months of the war was the drilling anti-aircraft half-track based on the 251D. Armament was three 15mm cannon obtained from obsolete Luftwaffe stocks, which were then attached to a pedestal mount and placed inside the hull of the half-track. All three barrels firing could spew out 2,100 rounds per minute. Those seen here are on the Oder front in March 1945. At the outbreak of war in 1939, the 88mm gun in its various versions, namely the 18, the 36 and the 37, formed the backbone of Germany's air defence system at home and in the Wehrmacht abroad. In its primary role of anti-aircraft gun, the 88mm could fire up to 15 rounds, each weighing 20 pounds every minute. This is being demonstrated by a Waffen-SS flak crew serving in Russia in the late summer of 1941. Accurate tracking of the Soviet aircraft and the use of rangefinders allow the gunners to place their shells close to the enemy plane. On this occasion, they're also employing a single 20mm Flak 30 alongside the 88. The rounds tail as a Soviet bomber, almost certainly a Tupolev SP-2, is hit and plunges downwards, disintegrating during its final dive. Another detachment of 88mm guns being employed in the anti-aircraft role, this time served by Luftwaffe flak teams, is also engaging Soviet aircraft in 1941. Significantly, the barrels of these 88s carry tank kills, so these Air Force personnel are already experienced employing them as anti-tank guns. In 
1941, the Army launched a program to mount the 88mm flak on a track chassis. The resultant Sonde Fagerstahl emerged in late 1942 with an 88mm flak 37 gun, and in 1944 the same chassis was employed to mount the more powerful 88mm flak 41. Once again, the design did not progress to production. The flak 41 had been designed by Rheinmetall Borsig and was rarely filmed just one being seen here employed in the anti-tank role in March 1945. Developed secretly in substitute for the heavy artillery denied them under the Versailles Treaty, the German army investment in multi-barrel rocket mortars was to provide them with a weapon of great utility in the Second World War. In first employment, it was realized that they were a weapon of psychological as well as destructive impact. The first type to see service in 1941 was the 150mm Werfer. Six mortar tubes mounted on a Pac-38 chassis ripple fired every two seconds. The larger, heavier 280 and 300mm rockets introduced in 1942 were also ripple fired in sixes, but from a wheeled, open-framed, heavy-duty launcher. The heaviest rocket also appeared in 1941 and utilised a crate-like launcher mounted on the ground and raised up to fire. These 320mm Werfers with incendiary warheads are being used for bombardment in the Warsaw Uprising. The real measure of the importance of these weapons to the German army can be seen in the growth of Werfer troops from 2,000 officers and men in 1939 to 135,000 in 1945. Such growth mirrors the effectiveness of these weapons. A battery of six 150mm launchers could let fly a salvo of 36 rockets in 10 seconds, with the second following just a minute later. As the war progressed, Werfers were massed in large numbers. A mixed brigade with 384 150mm barrels and 325 210mm barrels could saturate a target area with six tons of warheads in five seconds, repeating the process just a minute later. Conventional artillery needed 81 batteries of guns to achieve the same effect. The explosive impact of these weapons was also matched by the concussive effect. Werfers were not without their limitations, however. Their employment so close to the front line drew heavy enemy fire down upon them, and losses among Werfer troops were high. Werfer batteries were vulnerable before and after a launch. Film from Normandy shows how a battery once towed to its firing position by half-tracks then took some time to prepare to launch. Once loaded and fired, the flame and smoke trails left by the rockets marked out the position for eagle-eyed forward artillery observers. In Normandy, British counter-battery fire was very quick. Often Werfer crews were caught in artillery strikes as they packed up to move off to a new site. While the effect of these weapons could not be denied, the German army recognized the need to confer greater mobility on Werfer units to increase their effectiveness. The solution came in 1943 with an order to the firm of Opel to modify its semi-track mule load carrier to take an armored body. The half-track armored lorry produced by Opel in response to the army requirement employed the chassis of the company's basic Multier vehicle, to which they added an armoured body. The rocket launcher was a specially developed 10-tube type, and the ammunition carried allowed the vehicle to launch two salvos before a full replenishment was needed. These were obtained from resupply Multiers. Opel manufactured 300 of the Panzerwerfers and 289 resupply vehicles. A deployed battery of eight Panzerwerfers could launch 80 rockets in 20 seconds. Although most film of Panzerwerfer batteries in action show them in Russia, they were employed on all fronts. Many vehicles were attached and detached from Panzerwerfer brigades as need arose. The ability of the Panzerwerfer batteries to travel with armoured formations and be employed alongside self-propelled artillery detachments was especially important from late 1943 onwards as panzer divisions became fire brigades, rushing from one section of the front to another to deal with Soviet breakthroughs. Their ability to be on hand to bring down a rapid and devastating barrage on the enemy prior to a counter-attack was a most highly valued military asset. Forerunner of the Panzerwerfer was the 251 half-track, 
fitted out to carry six of the larger 280 or 320 mm rockets in wooden or metal frames attached to movable base plates on the sides of the vehicle. The former carried up to 110 pounds of high explosive, whereas the latter delivered 11 gallons of jellied petroleum. Reloads were carried within the vehicle. In operation, they functioned much as Panzerwerfers, excepting for the less effective method of firing and lower number of rockets launched. Unlike the Panzerwerfer, the rockets could only be aimed by pointing the whole vehicle at the target. Only the angle of the launcher frame could be changed. In other respects, the spectacle and sound was as for the same. These are late model 251Ds operating on the German-Dutch border late in 1944. The 600mm mortar, nicknamed Zhu, was the largest calibre weapon ever mounted on a tracked chassis and is seen bombarding Warsaw in August 1944 during the uprising. The heavier shell fired from the mortar weighed 2.17 tonnes. Just six were built as heavy siege weapons, with four used to reduce Sevastopol in 1942. At the other end of the scale, one of the smallest self-propelled weapons employed by the Germans was the remotely controlled demolition vehicle known as the Goliath. In this demonstration, a Goliath is brought to the testing ground on its two-wheel carriage. Control of the tracks was effected by two wires. The two small Bosch motors allowed it to move at up to 10 kilometers per hour. From his position, one of the soldiers studies the target. In this case, a captured Soviet Su-85 self-propelled gun. The Goliath is released and directed towards its target. Scuttling across the frozen ground, it is driven into the side of the Soviet machine. The target and Goliath are both destroyed by its onboard explosive charge. For six long years, the German army employed a wide range of self-propelled weapons, ranging from armoured trains and tank destroyers to super-heavy mortars, but first to conquer and ultimately to resist their many enemies on the long retreat back to Berlin.